So when uh, Ms. Horner said last week in her, in her opening statement that you're going to be wondering, when am I going to hear something about Edmund or what about Edmund? I thought she's right um, that, that that was going to be the case. But I, I hoped, and I do hope, that you would be patient with us because in order to prove that somebody conspired with another person to commit a crime or was an accomplice to another person when they committed a crime, you got to prove who, who committed it in the first place. But now it is time to talk about it. You heard multiple people say multiple very nice and kind things about Edwin yesterday. We have no reason to doubt them or doubt their sincerity. But they weren't in that van. And like Mr. Ruiz said yesterday, Edwin is all about family. His loyalty to his cousin got him involved in something that he should have never, ever agreed to go along with. There's no doubt that Dennis Munoz killed Michael Black, and there's no doubt that he was driven there by Edwin. The harder question for you, as counsel got to in, in, in her closing, is what did he know was going to happen? What did he think that was going to happen? What did he agree was going to happen? And as you saw, that was actually a question that our investigators kind of struggled with themselves for a couple weeks or even months. Maybe they didn't want to believe it. Maybe it didn't seem right. Hard-working guy, squared away. They definitely didn't jump to conclusions. They gave him multiple opportunities to explain these discrepancies. And with each opportunity that Edwin was given to kind of come clean about what happened, he lied. <coughs> Not because... He is by nature a dishonest man in any kind of way. He lied because he's a loyal man. But still, how do you know that that amounts to accomplice liability and being a co-conspirator? The judge is going to define those terms to you in detail. One thing you're going to notice is that it doesn't say anything about having to share the actor's motive. You don't have to have any motive at all about your actions. And so aiding or agreeing to aid someone doesn't have to be verbalized. There has to be no, there doesn't have to be a, a particular kind of oral <coughs> agreement. It also doesn't have to happen at a particular time in the past. You can agree in a moment. You can make a decision in less than a moment. So it didn't have to happen back at Walmart or in those calls at 5 p.m. or at McDonald's at 7.30. It could have happened on Elmhurst when he made that U-turn, parked around the corner, out of the way. He saw Wolf exit the van with a gun and decided to pop the hood and keep a lookout. He was aiding this murder. Wolf and his cousin are charged with separate, different crimes because their acts are very separate and different. Wolf committed this murder by pointing a gun at the victim, shooting him, and the victim died from his injuries. To be an accomplice, to be a conspirator, Edwin doesn't have to share Wolf's jealousy, his rage, his motive at all, his passion. It's enough to just that he knew what, intent, what Wolf's intent was and that he did things in agreement to help him accomplish that goal. So let's look at some details for Edwin. These are the calls before their, uh, their meeting at McDonald's. What they talk about, we don't know. But maybe something more complicated than I'll meet you at McDonald's. So Edwin told police that he went to McDonald's, but he didn't tell them that he never went inside. We know, based on what we see, that he was there to pick up Wolf. The first time, uh, <coughs> Ms. Horner pointed out that maybe there were some discrepancies and we shouldn't look too much into them. But the first time he told investigators that he went to Walmart, that after Walmart he went to the library parking lot downtown and then he went home. The second time he was questioned, he says he went to the library parking lot first, then Walmart, then back to the library parking lot, then home. He said that he was at home in Atlantic City by 8.30, when we know 
He didn't leave the EF, seek and see the S until 8.45. We know he was up all night, even though he had a, a flight the next day and work at 6.30 in the morning. He talks to Dennis all through the night for the first time in the history of their phones. Lieutenant Fine told you yesterday that they exchanged 14 calls and or texts over the course of that night with those calls. And in the entire history of their phones, a year, a year and a half before that, there was only another 14. Those conversations could not have been about their trip to Walmart. Could not have been about Edwin's trip to Florida. When Edwin was confronted by Tom Fine with the evidence that his van had been seen in Cloverleaf, <coughs> Edwin says, I can't help you. But Ms. Horner's half right. These are not humongous decisions. There's one reason, above all reasons, that we know that Edwin wasn't telling the whole truth. And that's because if he never went to Clover, if his whole night with Wolf was so innocent, then Wolf would have said that to him. Wolf would have said, I was with my cousin Edwin. We went to Walmart. We got some stuff for the kids. Big deal. When the police told Wolf, Dennis, that he was a suspect in the murder of Michael Black, don't you think he would have said I was on an innocent trip to Walmart with my cousin? But he didn't. Instead, he said this. At home, um, and you were home all night? Was anybody there with you? You were by yourself? I was by myself. You didn't leave at all during the I went across the street, you know what I mean? Like, I, I was on foot, so I walked a while, while. <coughs> a couple times, but... And you never, and what time did you, uh, what time were you in tonight? It was in all night, <laughs> not in for the night. I was, I was in all night. Um, you all, like, literally. So they, they chose two different alibis. And I think that's because they couldn't connect that later that morning to get their story straight. And no, and no work with me. Gee, hit me up. Back at this number. Um, I gotta go back at, I got, well, you know what, not even at this number. I've been trying to call you. But, but I don't want to call you from my phone. So this is dead. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I don't want to call you from my phone because it's dead. We know his phone wasn't there. He left this message at, I think, 12.01 p.m. We know that he had recently received a call from his boss, Tony Sample. We know that Detective Cruz <coughs> talked to Tony Sample and said, we need to speak with Edward. So this call from Tony Sample at 11.54, which by the way is the only call from Tony Sample that day, on, is on Edwin's actual phone. And they have a phone conversation at 11.54. <coughs> One minute and 18 seconds. So at 11.54, or sometime thereafter, Edwin knows that the police want to speak with him. And so he's got to call, whoa, he's got to call his co-conspirator but he doesn't want to call him from his phone, as we just heard. Not, I can't call you from my phone. I don't want to call you from my phone. And so he uses this other person's phone at 12.01 to call Wolf and leave that message. He says his phone isn't on, but it was on enough for him to have a minute and 18 long, excuse me, minute and 18 second long phone call with his boss. 
And it was on enough at 12.46 to show it to the investigators and have them look at it. So it's because of that misconnection that they end up telling those very different stories. Then we know about Wolf from the county jail after his charges trying to reach out to Edmund, tell him not to talk to the police, tell him they don't know about any gun. So if Edwin had no role in the planning and didn't help in any kind of way. If it was like, uh, take me to this dude's house, uh, I'm going to talk to him, well, then he wouldn't be guilty. But that's not what happened. They waited until the time that they knew from Dolores Palmer that Mike would be home. They saw his work bin, they made that U turn, and they parked out of the way around the corner out of view with the van pointed south for a quick getaway. We know Wolf, or we know the second male, changes his direction at some point. Maybe he sees Kayla and he turns around, or whatever. Edwin popped the hood, which let him keep an eye out. Again, remember how confident Wolf was that there were no witnesses? he had somebody keeping an eye on If Edwin wasn't involved in this, if this was all foisted upon Edwin all of a sudden, Wolf wouldn't have texted him the next morning about how it all worked out completely for the better. This was not just Wolf's spontaneous, violent act. This was part of a shared plan. statement where he starts out by essentially pretending that he barely knows who Mike Black is. First he says, oh, what do you mean, my cousin? <coughs> Ultimately, he's detained, and again, he gets into jail, he calls Courtney, and he doesn't say, hey, it's all a big misunderstanding, I was with Edwin at Walmart. He says this. Tell Edwin as far as I'm, that number one, they don't know about, well, as far as anything, they don't know anything about any, they, they know nothing about any weapon. They know nothing about any gunshot residue. They didn't even care about that. They didn't even ask about that. Uh, I'll talk about gunshot residue. All right, I'll talk about that. Um, so during his interview, Wolf mentioned three separate times that he really wanted the investigators to swipe his fingers for gunshot residue. During his jail calls, he talks about it a bunch more times. <coughs> it all comes from watching too many cop shows. He even says on one of his calls, I watched every special there is pertaining to that, talking about investigations and that sort of thing. We know the difference between fact and, and fiction. We all heard you during the course of your voir dire say that you like to watch cop shows and CSI and that sort of thing. The state knows that you understand the difference between fact and fiction. And anyway, it doesn't matter. Because he was not wearing the same clothes the next day that he was the night before. He told his father, or maybe Courtney, that he was. But these are different hooded sweatshirts. This is a Stockton gray one. This is some other kind of green one with a different font and a different size. He also had gloves. He had gloves on him the day that he was detained, and he had gloves the night before. You can see in the Walmart video, he's taking them off as he enters the store. This is November 9th. It's not that cold. We know it's not that cold because when he goes outside of the Walmart and hangs out there for a little bit, he doesn't put the gloves on. So again, how can a person be so confident that you should take and swipe my shirt or swipe my fingers, well, if you change your shirt, if you put on gloves, or 
you just plain washed your hands sometimes in the past 16 hours, you're pretty set. So, Wolf is confused in the jail calls about how they got him so quickly. He's racking his brain about how they were able to charge him without all this fancy stuff that he sees on TV. of evidence that this defendant can conceive to think of is either a video or a dying declaration. A dying declaration, which is what we have in this case. And why does he think that that might be a possibility? Again, because Mike wasn't dead immediately after he shot him. He saw him run inside the house, or at least knew that he didn't drop right away. So he knows that this is possible. The only way he knows that's possible is if he was there. The only way he says that is if he did it. And then he turns his focus over to court. It'll all prove out in court, you heard? Like, because, they, inshallah, the next time that they try to get statements from you, it's going to be nothing. It's going to be saying that there is no, there was never no ground for, for be, between us. Like, you heard? Like, yeah. So he's already. By the way, these, these three calls are all less than 24 hours after the homicide. This is before anything was in the paper about anything, and this is before Courtney had that conversation with him about uh, uh, Mike calling 911. That happens on the 14th. This is four days earlier. But anyway, within 24 hours, he's already tampering with the witnesses. He's already telling her, they come to talk to you, there's nothing about any drama between us. This continues and continues and continues for years. And you heard Courtney talk about it, and that's what brings us to the witness tampering. <coughs> Since the day of his arrest, he's been trying to get the witnesses against him to bend to his will, to pretend that they don't remember, to say that they were on drugs and you know they're not that credible. <coughs> And you're going to have a chance to see really just one example of this through the letters uh, that were sent to the Wycliffe residence. So the letter is dated October 2018 because that's when Wolf sent it. That's when the crime occurred. But their whole history is culminated in this threat. Somebody wants to, if a stranger threatens you and you get an envelope that says, do what I say, you say, well, who are you? So their whole history is part and parcel of this letter. Their whole history is relevant. Everything that Wolf ever did to Courtney, every threat, worse, is part of this letter. Everything that happened between Wolf and Keith and Heather is part of this, the stuff that they told you about. The night that Wolf showed up with Steve and Edwin demanding baby furniture or stuff from the house. It's all uh, the, the part where I think he told Heather that she was uh, harboring Courtney and she should kick her out in the street so she would go back to him. It doesn't matter when that occurred. It matters that when he sent this in October 2018, that that was implicit, implicit threats in this, along with the explicit ones that are actually written on the pages that you see. whole plan with the clicker really ruined. 
I want to thank you, in, <coughs> almost in conclusion, um, for your patience and your uh, attention in this trial. It's almost done. After the jury instructions, it's almost time to go inside that, that jury room and, and start deliberating. And when you do, all I'm asking from you is that you think real hard, give, give all the evidence all the attention it deserves, give their arguments all the attention they deserve, and apply your common sense. It's the same thing that you had with you when you walked in the door more than two weeks ago when we had jury selection. It's the same thing that's going to stay with you long after this trial. When you look at the evidence and you apply your common sense, you're going to see that those letters could only be written by a person with a guilty conscience. You're going to see that those texts could only be sent by the murderer of Michael Black. You're going to see that Edwin's statements cannot be true because Wolf decided it would be better to just say he was nowhere that night. They all amount to consciousness of guilt. There's a lot of that in that box. There's been a lot of that in this trial. Let me show you one more. So, after Courtney tells Dennis that Mike had died, that was that 18 minute phone call at 7.40. So they get off the phone at 7.58, Wolf calls Edwin, Four minutes later, after they get off the phone, this is Dennis's text to Courtney. I love you too, death in parentheses, love. So this is four minutes after the phone call where he learns that Mike is dead. A person can confess to a crime without ever actually saying, I did it. In asking you to apply your common sense to all this stuff and my arguments and what the judge can instruct you on the law, <coughs> I ask you to believe Dennis Williams. Believe him in the three different times, at least, that he said he was going to kill Michael Black. Believe Michael Black. Believe a man in the last moments of his life trying to make sure that his kids are okay. A literal hole in his body. A literal hole through his heart and I think his lung. Look at him. He had no reason to lie. I know exactly who it is. His name is Wolf. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.